Hello everybody, um, as Ian said, I'm Alex, I run the Producer Offset Unit and on my left here is Susan Wells, who is one of my key assessment officers um, and we're here to tell you how to get your offset faster. That's pretty much what we're here for. From our point of view that's important because we don't want to do as much work as we currently do, to be perfectly frank, because as you can tell from the number of people here and the fact that we had well over 100 people at this event in Sydney, there are a lot of people wanting their offsets, so we have a lot of applications to assess. As far as we're concerned, the less we have to do on an application, the better. But the corollary to that is that you guys need to do a better job of filling in your applications forms, so be good. Um, Matt seems to think, when he put up that video, that the industry is all about the content and the industry is all about the outcome on screens. As we all know here in this room, that is absolutely not the, not the case. The industry is entirely about application forms and spreadsheets <laughs> and how well you fill them in. So first, I'm just going to pop up a quick slide introducing you to the Producer Offset team. There are only two of us here. As I said, this is Susan Wells. But the crucial thing to keep in mind here is that that's it. There's only six of us, and we run a $200 million program. Um, so I head the unit, Michelle McDonald, Colleen Champ, and Susan um, do the lion's share of the assessments. We also have Law Didier, who is also an assessment officer, and she's fantastic because she speaks French. So if you do a co-pro, she's your girl. And this person here, Louisa Achille, is the key, because Louisa is the person that receives your application. And unless Louisa says that application is complete, none of us who assess the applications will ever see it. So what we're going to do this morning is go through a provisional application form largely so that you know the key mistakes people make in filling in a provisional application form and what you can do to make sure your application gets assessed faster. Um, just a couple of other notes about this. As Ian said before, we are filming this and there will be microphones. Please, if you have a question, and I should say, I, we want this to be quite iterative, so feel free just to stick your hand up and ask a question. Don't be surprised if I say, hold that, we'll come back to it. But if you do have a question, please wait for the microphone. And the other thing is the microphones will only work if you hold them here right up to your mouth. So um, don't do this because we won't hear you. And if you do, I'll repeat the question. Um, you don't need to take a lot of notes because we do have handouts to hand out to you at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Um, anything else no. housekeeping wise? No. no. Okay. All right. So I'm handing over to Susan. Um, hi everybody. I'm Susan Wells, as Alex has repeated several times. Um, in your little show bag that you got today, one of the documents that we've given you is a little book called At a Glance. And really, it's probably worth saying from the outset that this is um, our Bible in the offset. So anything that we talk about today, as Alex said, will be in your At a Glance. Um, and it's kind of an A to Z guide of the offset. So if you don't know whether legal fees are quape or not, or what legal fees are, you just look up L for legal fees. Um, if you don't know what an Australian resident is, you look up A for Australian resident. So that really, that's on our website, and it's um, much more interactive on the website, but really that is our Bible. So yeah, don't take any notes, everything's in there. Um, and you can just relax and hear what we have to say. Um, I just wanted to sort of talk a bit about what Ian was saying before. We've mentioned the ATO a lot, and I just think it's really important to say that the you know, producer offer, offset op does operate under tax legislation, but it was also really great to see that spa clip at the beginning, and I didn't, hadn't thought about it in Sydney, but when I was looking at it today, um, and I think I'm allowed to say this, that pretty much everything you saw on screen would have, had, would have been made with the assistance of the producer offset, so clearly some objective is being met there and we can't talk about individual projects and whether they receive the offset or not. Yes, what Susan's trying to say is we can't confirm or deny that any given project has or has not applied <coughs> for or received a provisional certificate or a final certificate for the producer offset but it may or may not be the case that all of those projects which were on that video did or did not apply for the producer <laughs> offset. 
And the offset is very dry, so it's kind of great to associate <laughs> what you're doing and your form filling with what you see on the screen there. So as Alex was saying before, I'm just going to talk you through the process really briefly. Um, Louisa, our coordinator, is a really key part of our team. So what happens um, as a producer, you send in your application, it hits Louisa's desk, um, she logs it and she checks that application thoroughly to see if anything's missing. Um, it's probably more pertinent at final, to be honest, because there's a lot more documentation, but even at provisional, you know, if you haven't you know, put in your Quape spreadsheet or she even looks to see whether your budget's matching your Quape spreadsheet at that point. So if something's not working or the application is not complete, she'll contact you straight away via email and let you know whether there's anything missing. Um, and she'll give you a reference number, which is really important because a lot of people need that reference number to give um, funding bodies when they're applying for funding to Screen Australia or Film Victoria. Um, and our advertised sort of turnaround times in our website for provisional certificates are six weeks and for finals are 12 weeks. And what's really important, we always talk about it's six weeks from receipt of a complete application. And really the clock doesn't start ticking in, in terms of you know, those time frames until your application is complete. So Alex is right in saying it actually doesn't leave Louisa's desk until she's satisfied that it's complete. And then it basically goes up onto a board and it gets allocated to an assessor. So that's really sort of the upfront process. And, and what people do is it, um, they submit a provisional certificate, you go and make your film, you come in for a final certificate, and then you take that final completed. So that's basically the circle of what happens with your offset. Um, you don't have to apply for a provisional certificate. Um, most people do um, because cash flow providers want that piece of paper saying how much offset you think you're going to get back, um, but, but it's not mandatory and that's sort of important to remember. So what are we looking for when, we're, um, when we get your provisional application? Um, you know, Alex was, you know, we're, to we're really talking today about why you need to complete these forms correctly and how important it is. And really we're looking at your form um, to determine whether your project is eligible or not. Um, and the key eligibility criteria for us are um, significant Australian content, does your project meet the SAC test, uh, format, is your project of an eligible format, and the quape threshold. And there are, are an, a number of other eligibility criteria that you need to meet, like is your film completed <coughs> at final, is the company an eligible company, but we'll take it as a given that you know, you've done all those things properly. And really these are the three key things that we're looking at. Mm. The other matters, we will look at at final, but they'll largely be automatic. In most cases, you're going to meet them. We don't really. Yeah, take it would be very. I mean, very rare at final that you haven't completed your film. Or yeah, it'd be pretty tough. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, Ian's already talked a lot about SAC, and SAC, I guess, is really one of the key eligibility criteria for us in the offset. And it's not a ticker box test, which is really important to remember. And there's not one element, which I'll, I'll go through the elements in a minute. But there's not one element that knocks you out of the SAC test. And we kind of uh, look at it, I guess, in a holistic way. And sometimes kind of, you know, what we're really looking at is, you know, asking whether your film is Australian in its DNA is kind of quite a good way of looking at it. Um, and it is a flexible test, um, thereby not tick a box. And some people get frustrated by this because they can't just fill out a form and say, oh, great, my film meets the SAC test. But actually, I think it's very beneficial that it's flexible. Um, and probably the other important thing to note is, you know, if, you're com if you come in and we deem that your project doesn't meet the SAC test, you know, the gate's not closed. There is an opportunity for you to change elements of your production. Um, to the extent yeah, that you can. Yeah, to the extent that you can. Sometimes there's things that you can't change, like if it's based on a, you know, a German novel written by a UK scriptwriter, clearly you can't change those elements, but you know, you might decide to shoot more of it in Australia or undertake more post or to cast a, an Australian actor in the lead, not a German actor or something like that. And it can, can become quite, um, quite iterative. <coughs> um, if we take a project to the board and the board doesn't think it has a significant Australian content, rather than saying you're ineligible for the offset, mm. we'll get back to you and say, we don't think you meet the SAT test. Is there anything you can do? Um, and if you can up the Australianness, for want of a better term, then come back in and we'll, re we'll look at it again. <coughs> Excuse me. So the, mat the matters that the five matters that we look at for the SAT test. The first one is subject matter of the film, um, and 
we're not, we're not looking, I don't know what the expression Alex came up with a few years ago, we're not looking for koalas in a cobra. You actually could have a film about koalas with Stetsons on and it still might meet the SAC test. Might do. Hey? Might do. Might do. Um, so the subject matter of the film, what we're looking for is, we're, we're asking questions, you know, is the film about Australia or Australians? Uh, did the project originate in Australia? Was it developed by Australians? Maybe it's based on an Australian story, maybe it's not. Is the film about Australian characters and how much of the film is set in Australia? So they're the sort of things that we're looking at in terms of the subject matter of the film. I think the important thing to note there is that subject matter it kind of has two aspects to it. There is literally what the film's about and what it tells a story of, but there's also this concept of Australian development, which is very important because one of the key aspects of the offset is it's supposed to open up the Australian production industry to foreign investment, foreign finance and most of all foreign audiences. And in many cases that means that you may not be able to make your film every time about you know, koalas and akubras. You might need to have a Stetson and a baseball. Um, and that shouldn't knock you out. So from our point of view, the subject matter of the film, the, ex the, the extent to which we have to have regard to that, what we're after is how much Australian involvement was there in the development of the subject matter of the film. And we, sort of, we refer to that behind the scenes as off-screen subject matter. Um, what we're really after is there must be something in what we call this top box. You have to be able to show us something, whether that be subject matter on screen or something behind the scenes in terms of development. But if you're going for a development aspect, it has to be meaningful and substantial. Realistically, if you've got a fully developed American project which has nothing to do with Australia at all on screen, it may well be too late and the project may well not meet the SAC test. Uh, and the second element we're looking at is the place where the film will be made and this is literally we're talking about how much of the film is going to be produced in Australia. We're not talking about the on-screen setting which we would be thinking about in subject matter. We're just literally talking about the actual location of where the work took place and really we're looking at pre, the shoot and post-production. Um, the third one is nationalities and places of residencies of people who took part in the making of the film. And the key personnel that we're looking at in this area are the producers, obviously, it's the producer offset, um, directors, authors, if the film was based on an underlying work, script writers, composers, um, the key cast, um, and then what we call the key creatives on the film, which would be the editor, the director of photography and production designers. And we also look at um, other film technicians, just the on-set on crew and who you're using on the film. Mm. It kind of think about that as being a, um, almost in, in tiers. We sort of look at the producer, mm. writer, director at the top, they're going to be the most important because you, know, you guys are fundamental. I mean, my personal view is that production accountants are the most important people on a film. But um, the producers are, yeah, true. Um, and then heads of department and key cast, then supporting cast and other crew, and then you know, post companies, VFX firms, that sort of thing as well. And but we look at everyone. And we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, what we mean, you know, what we're looking at here is Australian nationals or Australian residents. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail when we go to the application form, I think. Yep. Um, so the fourth one is um, what we call details of production expenditure. And really, um, that is a mathematical, probably one of the only mathematical things that we look at. And really, we're looking at what percentage of your budget was spent in Australia. And that would be either on Australians or non-Australians. And then we look at what percentage of your budget was spent outside Australia. So at, at Provisional, it's really important for you to have an idea in your budget if you are shooting overseas, you know, how much of that budget is going to be spent overseas on what we call non-Australian elements. So we'd be looking at your budget and your quote spreadsheet very closely if that was the case. Um, and the last one is a good one. Any other matters that Screen Australia considers to be relevant? And what we're really looking at here is who retains copyright in the film, who has final approval rights, and really what we're talking about here is final cut, and who receives a share of returns in the film. Mm. We'll come to that a little bit yeah. later. But the, the crucial thing about this is it's not any other matters in the sense that Alex Sangston and Susan Wells don't like the film. That's clearly not a relevant matter. Um, what is going to be relevant is something in the concept of the film, which, as Susan said before, gives it Australianness in its DNA. And often that is these things that sit sort of behind the scenes in the terms of the deals. And that can be, they can be the sort of things that get you over the line if you're, you know, down a little bit, for want of a better term, up here. 
but it can be quite, a, it's an alchemical mm. sort of process. Yeah. And each, it should be said, just in terms of our process, look, you know, most of most projects that hit our desk are what we call vanilla Australian projects, and there's just absolutely no issue with SAC or Quape or Format or, or anything, to be honest. I mean, probably 90% or... I would say 90% yeah, have no SAC issues at just all. just have no issues at all. Um, and what our process is, if, if a project is looking like, um, you know, it has less Australian elements than another project, um, we have a committee and then we also have the Screen Australia board that might consider a project if it had um, was borderline. Mm. It might be worth mentioning the committee here. I'm very conscious of this poor cameraman that's just playing tennis here. Um, the, that, the Mentioning the committee because it came up at the Sydney session. The, the committee is an internal management committee and its role is very much to make decisions in relation to the producer offset. For, as Susan said, the vast majority of projects, they're completely vanilla, there is no issues at all, there's no controversy, there's no problems with its eligibility and they are signed off at my level. Um, and I literally will approve it and sign the certificates. For projects which might have a slightly higher budget, slightly higher offset, a slightly less Australianness, so there's actually questions to be made. There might be some format issues with it. We refer it to our committee, and the committee is made up of senior execs within the agency who aren't doing their jobs as senior execs in their agency. They are acting as the producer offset and co-production committee. Uh, it's quite an important distinction. Um, that makes fortnightly. Just because a project gets referred to the committee, don't worry. Mm. They still tick off 90 to 90 percent of the projects they're pre presented with. Then for the projects which are quite problematic, quite controversial or very large, they go to the board um, and the board will make the final decision. Okay, so we've talked about SAC. Um, now the other two key eligibility criteria we look at, the first one is format. So your project has to be an eligible format um, and there are specific <coughs> formats that are not eligible and they're all listed in the at a glance and the final and the provisional application form. But that would be something like a game or reality, t oh, sorry. Ooh, sorry. reality TV or... Reality television um, other than a documentary. Yes, other than a documentary or the filming of a live sporting event. There's a whole, whole list of things on the provisional form that are not eligible. But really the key things that we're, that we're looking at when we get your application form in terms of format, and we'll talk about this when we go through the application form, is um, does your project meet the definition of a documentary or is your project a feature film? So they're really probably the two key things that we're looking at. Um, and the last one, but very important, is your quote threshold. Um, so each format has a minimum quote threshold that has to be met and some require a per hour threshold as well as a, a, an overall threshold. And probably the key change in the last couple of years um, is to the feature film threshold which was reduced from a million dollars to $500,000. So that, that's probably one of the key changes that was made um, and that all, a year or so ago. All of that introductory stuff may well have seemed a little bit basic and it was pretty <laughs> straightforward. And to be perfectly frank, everybody in this room should already know everything that we told you. But the reason that we mentioned it all was largely because we're <coughs> contextualising what we're about to do now. What we are really keen for you to understand is why we ask you the information that we ask and why having everything down on the application form is actually really important and it all ties back to the decisions we're making. So, I mean, this is, we're not really going to talk about this, this page in detail, but this is the application for a provisional certificate and really I think Alex hit the nail on the head. Um, in when we had this seminar in Sydney is that our aim is to not have to ask you any questions mm. and that kind of probably seems impossible to some people but we literally want to get an application from from you not ask you any questions assess it very quickly and issue you with your certificate so for that's a, our aim for a, yeah for a project we should be able to pick up an application form assess it within an hour and have the certificate mm. done within two yeah. that's our, that's our aim <laughs> and in most cases it should be possible Okay. Yes, yes, absolutely, it does. <laughs> you won't see um, that. You won't see that. The quest, the comment from the from uh, the from the crowd was, has it ever happened? And honestly, um, at provisional stage, you know, you're probably all familiar with what we refer to as the old rules and the new rules. The old rules had, you know, GST. There was a lot more things that um, weren't eligible for quape. And under the new rules, you know, Alex is right. If, if we pick up a project and it's all been done properly and there's no issues, it takes us no time at all. Even Matt it. Dina can calculate yep. quape under the new rules. <laughs> you heard it here first. Okay, um, we're not going to take you through every page of the application form, but the first section we're going to have a look at is the applicant information. 
Um, and this might seem really basic, um, but it is really important to fill this out properly. Yeah, I and should point out the reason we're raising these particular pages, even though some of them look obvious, is because people continually make mistakes on these pages. Yeah. And probably the key Naughty. thing to note here is, um, you know, you've got your applicant company there, which is parent company PTY LTD, is that most people at Provisional, if they're going to set up an SPV for their project, haven't done so yet. And that's probably one of our most common questions is, you know, is it okay to apply in the name of another company and then go and make your film and then apply in the name of the SPV at the end? And that is completely fine, that, completely normal. Um, so yeah, just, just put down the name of your company, give us the names of the company directors and what their nationalities are and where they live. And you might not be able to see it on this form, um, sorry, on the screen here. Um, but you need to attach a, a sort of formal company statement. Um, generally, this would come from ASIC, and it's not just the basic, uh, yeah, it's something you have to pay for, basically, that lists all the shareholders and the directors of the company. It's not just your company registration. Mm. That's when the it, way you can tell. Yeah. If it's the one that's got the addresses and the names of the company directors and the shareholders and the officers, yeah. that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. So you, you do need to attach that, and that, that is important. And really, what it gets down to is that we're just substantiating this stuff. Um, and again, you may not be able to see down the bottom, but there's, there's two key boxes that you need to tick there. And one of them um, is that the applicant for a final certificate will be responsible for the making of the project in its entirety. And that might sound, sort of sound like gobbledygook, but it kind of relates to what I was saying before, is that you know, often the applicant will be a different company. And so clearly at some point, the parent company is going to have to you know, have chain of title documents and you know, production investment agreements that hand over the rights to make the film to the SPV. So and that is, of course, one of the other legislative criteria when we said before that there are a bunch of mechanical ones. That's one of the mechanical ones. But we still need to be able to say, yes, it's the case. Um, and the, the other important ticker box or cross a box section there is um, to acknowledge that your applicant company is not acting in the capacity of a trustee of a trust. And Alex is just going to expand yeah, that, on that a little bit. That's got a couple of um, companies into trouble. When the Tax Act, and as we've said a couple of times, this is tax legislation we're dealing with, so we're subject completely to what's in the Tax Act. When the Tax Act says a company, it means a company acting in that capacity and not in any other capacity, like as a trustee of a trust. So if any company is actually, if this up here said parent company PTYLTD ATF, um, parent company family trust, we'd be rejecting the application because it is not a company for the purposes of the offset. The other thing to keep in mind is that that company, when, when you incur expenditure, you can only incur, incur quape if it's a company act incurring that expenditure. So if it's a company acting as a trustee of a trust, it can't incur expenditure. So if you're incurring development expenditure right now in a trustee company, you're going to lose that and it won't be quape for the purposes of the producer offset. So. If you do have a trust in your company structure somehow, talk to a lawyer and maybe look at doing something else. Uh, okay, format and duration. So here um, are the boxes that you tick to see what format your project is. And here we've just ticked feature film, which is pretty simple, 100 minutes. And then these are the other formats that are eligible. Single episode programs, other than a documentary, that would be like a telemovie or something single episode program documentary and short form animation. So if your project is one of those formats, um, <coughs> this part of the form is relatively simple and you can just keep going. But if we just go to the next page, um, this is also applies to format and duration. What we're looking at here is a season of a series, either a drama or an animation, or a season of a series, which is a documentary. And just sort of some clarity um, for a moment on you know, what we're talking about when we talk about a season of a series, um, because I think in the industry there has been a little bit of confusion to date. Um, for the purposes of the offset, um, we're looking at a season as, as the film, legislatively speaking. So if you make a series called My Family, then the first season is going to be called My Family Season 1. And when you finish, it might be six episodes, and when you finish making that season, you can apply for the offset. And then you get some more money, fantastic, everybody loves your show, and you're going to make My Family Season 2. So then you go and make another six episodes, and then you come in and apply for the offset for the next six episodes. So each of those, the, the whole series is called My Family, and then it's made up of seasons. So it's really important from an offset point of view 
when we're referring to season one, season two, season three. And the reason we talk about seasons of a series is that there is a 65 commercial hour cap on the producer offset. Under the old rules it was 65 episodes, um, but that's changed. So really this part of the form, you know, if, if you are a season of a series, you do need to fill this out properly, especially if you've already made maybe four or five seasons of your series, you might be starting to reach up to your 65 commercial hour cap. Mm. Um, were you going to say something about new creative concept briefly? I or? will, but the other thing, just before I move to that, uh, the one thing I'd note is you may well not know that you're actually doing season one when you make your series. Mm. Um, and in that case, you'll probably just tick this box and you'll go through and it'll say everything that it needs to say down here. But what you'll actually get is a provisional certificate for my film dash season one. Yep. We will assume for our purposes that it is season one, just in case you do more. Because if we certify it as a series, then you'd be done and you couldn't actually apply for season two. So we'll assume it's a season regardless of what you tell us. Um, the important thing here is that sometimes projects look like previous series but aren't and these aren't abnormal, these are spin-offs and we're all aware of that in the industry. Now the offset legislation provides you with the ability to make spin-offs and it will reset the 65 commercial hour cap and there's a test in the legislation called the new creative concept test and what you will have to do is argue that your project has a new creative concept. So if you are making a spin-off or something that looks similar in some ways or a reboot for example, anything that looks similar to a previous series regardless of whether that series was made under the offset or not it's worth preempting the fact that we're going to ask about you about it anyway because we're going to have to assess it and analyze it so add a schedule which argues why the project has a new creative concept how do we decide what a new creative concept is it's in the at a glance um, basically it says we have to have regard to it's structured kind of the same as the sac test screen australia must determine if it has a new creative concept having regard to the title of the series whether there are any substantially different production locations, characters, people involved in the making and a couple of other things and our old favourite, any other matters. Um, but yeah, call us if you've got any doubt but I think one of our key themes for this is if there's anything unusual about our project, the best thing you can do is preempt the questions. So if there's something unusual about your project and you think there's something you need to add to contextualise your application, add a schedule to the application mm. form, just draft a Word doc that explains it because we'll ask you for it anyway. Yep. So save yourself the time. Yep. Um, and so if we look at this page and on the previous page you've got single episode program documentary and season of a series documentary. So if, we, if you've ticked that box, if you think about what I was talking about at the beginning in terms of you know, is your project eligible for the offset? It does need to be an eligible format. And one of the key issues we look at daily is whether your project meets the definition of a documentary. So if you're ticking one of those boxes, we're gonna ask ourselves these questions that Alex mm. is gonna go through. The beauty of it now, and it's not, not a great secret, we had a, um, a legal um, discussion with, with a previous applicant about a project called Lush House. Um, and following that, the government in its wisdom decided that what needed to happen was that the offset legislation needed to define what it meant by a documentary. Now this is important because if you're, as Susan said, if you're applying under the Quaid threshold for a documentary, it's lower than the Quaid threshold for a drama series. So if you'd only meet the documentary threshold, then we have to be satisfied that it's a documentary. If you're higher at the higher level threshold, 500,000 per hour, we kind of don't care. Um, but there are also those ineligible formats, including things like as I said before, reality television other than a documentary, whereas you've got a project that looks like reality television, we might need to ask whether it's a documentary to see if it's not reality television, if that makes sense, sort of like a carve out. But the important thing now is that we know what a documentary means in relation to the producer offset because the government put it in the legislation, which is fantastic for us because it gives us all certainty. And this stuff should look, for, should look familiar to anybody because it's based on what's in the ACMA guidelines. So it is, according to the legislation, a creative treatment of actuality, having regard to, there's that phrase, the extent and purpose of any contrived uh, situation, uh, whether the extent to which it explores an idea, idea or theme, overall narrative structure of the project, and our old favourite, any other matters. I love that. I'd put any other matters on birthday cards if I could. <laughs> um, but importantly, a documentary isn't just those things. It is not a documentary if it is 
an infotainment or lifestyle program, and that definition is act that is defined. Infotainment is defined in the Broadcasting Services Act, and that in that definition is incorporated into the Tax Act. This stuff is all in detail on our website. Or a magazine program. Now, it doesn't say magazine program in the legislation, but it describes it. Um, but what it means is a magazine program. So if your project is going to come close to the line, and you guys know, you know, if you've got something that looks a bit reality TV or looks <coughs> a bit infotainment or looks a bit magazine-y, you guys are going to know. Preempt the fact that we're going to have to ask you about it. It's not that we're going to say, no, it's not eligible, or no, it's not a documentary, or yes, it's reality TV. What we need is sufficient information in order to make the decision. So preempt the fact that we're going to ask and add a schedule that outlines this test. Yeah, and it's important to remember we don't know anything. We generally won't know anything about your program. And for example, if, it, if it's something that will go to the committee, Really, we just, you know, we in the offset unit need to provide the committee with as, as much information possible for them to make a decision. Mm. So, you know, and we work very um, collaboratively with applicants. So if, if we think, you know, you're, you, you know, you might need something else, we will ask for it. But Alex is right. If, if you can preempt that and just provide a narrative or a, a production bible or something very detailed that we can go off that's really really helpful and i'm not saying that every project which is a documentary needs to no. provide a five page essay about no. why their project Certainly is a documentary not. you know it's and generally pretty clear it's generally pretty clear if it is we've got those you know 80 to 90 percent of document projects are clearly documentaries because they just are no one can argue about them but it's always those things around the <laughs> margins where we're just going to need a bit more information does anyone have any questions about anything so far when, um, when you say a contrived situation, are you referring to the idea that, you, that there is a possibility to have a certain amount of the project be set up by the filmmakers without it not being, and that won't automatically turn it into a, not a documentary? Is that yeah. what you're meaning? Absolutely. Okay, I just want to clarify is, that. What we're asking is, is it a creative treatment of actuality? But we have to have regard to these things. It doesn't mean, sorry, I should have explained this. It doesn't mean you have to tick all of these things or not tick all of these things. It's like the SAC test. It's a holistic assessment of all of these factors. So yes, you can have a contrived situation because what we're having regard to is the extent or purpose of any contrived situation. So you may well make Supersize Me, which was a completely contrived situation. And the extent of it is pretty contrived, but the contrivance is only the setup. And the ex so the extent of that contrivance is only really to set up what actually happens in the film. And if you look at the ACMA guidelines, the way that talks about this issue is it, it, it describes it as being, you can set up a situation so long as what you're actually doing is setting up a situation and then you film what happens afterwards. So the rest of it is the actuality, if you like. Yeah, and you explore, uh, for those who don't know, Supersize Me is about a guy who decides to eat McDonald's for 30 days in a yeah. row and not eat anything else. So that is completely, that's his idea, it is, it is contrived. But then the documentary goes on to explore that idea and those themes associated with what he's decided yeah. to do. And crucially, I just think that the crucial thing there is that you, you contrive the setup, but mm -hmm. you don't really have any control about what the outcome's gonna be. That's, that's right. kind you're not of important. Writing yeah. the whole thing right to the yeah, end. Exactly. What you're doing is writing, we're gonna do this and then we're going to film whatever happens yeah. regardless and we're not controlling what's going yeah. to happen particularly. Exactly. Any other questions about documentaries or SAC or...? Good. Okay. Um, oh. Okay, dates. This looks boring, but it's not. Oh, this is fascinating. Um, so this is at Provisional. What it's we're a spreadsheet. What we're looking at here is your proposed production schedule. Um, so clearly, at Provisional stage, you may not know exactly, you know, when you're going to start your shoot or when you're going to start pre. Um, but give us an idea. It's helpful. And and what we're really looking at here is how, if you think about what I was talking about with the SAC test earlier in terms of where was your film made and where are you spending your money. This is really one of the key triggers for us. And we go, oh, OK. Um, this company spent a week's pre in the UK, two weeks shoot in the UK, and did four weeks of music work in the UK. So we can just immediately see, oh, OK, the whole production did not take place in Australia. And we'll be looking, when we get your budget, we'll be looking you know, that will trigger us and we'll go, okay, well, where are those items budgeted for? And then we'll be looking at your Quate spreadsheet to work out whether you have excluded or not excluded those elements. So this 
um, date section is important and it has relevance to both SAC in terms of where you're making your film and where you're spending your money, but also has relevance to Quape. Um, but really the key thing here for us is um, you can only claim Quape for, um, if you do any offshore work, you can only claim Quape if your project meets the Gallipoli Clause. Just hold for a second yep. before we get to Gallipoli Clause. I just want to explore this a little bit more. <laughs> um, people make mistakes on this all the time. And okay? there's actually a mistake on this one. I is there? So. There yeah. is a mistake on that one. Yeah. We made an error. Actually, that's funny. Damn. That is often where people make mistakes in that box. So we did that deliberately. Yep. Um, this here, this is the total post weeks. Literally, it doesn't, it's not going to be that totaled. It is going to be date one of post to the end of post. Um, and it won't be the total of these because they will happen concurrently. So just keep in mind that. Um, and obviously what we'd actually expect if we'd done this correctly and not deliberately made an error is that um, yeah, that, that and that should equal that, yeah. always. And this, this, as Susan said, triggers a lot of things for us. It triggers um, an assessment of those couple of matters in the SAC test, but it, all, it can also do interesting things, like in this one, we've got the music's being done in the UK. Now, if you've got in your application form that it's an Australian composer, it's going to raise a question for us, because it's unlikely that you're going to be doing the music in the UK with an Australian composer. You might be, but that's another example of one of those things that you should preempt. It's something that looks a little weird. Mm. We don't want to have to ask you about it. And if you can answer it by providing just a little bit of contextual information with the application form, it'll save everyone a truckload of time. It might be Nick Cave. And it if might it was be Nick, Nick Cave. Cave and he was composing the music in the UK, it would be non quake Absolutely. Which you can work out from reading your Anna Um <laughs> God, we're nerds. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just dashing around here. OK, the Gallipoli Clause. Um, Okay, this is all about claiming quake for offshore shooting. So there is a very limited provision in our legislation where you can claim expenditure um, incurred outside Australia as quake. And my understanding is this originally came from the documentary sector, who, you know, they might be going to the Galapagos Islands to make a film about, you know, the mating season of unusual turtles, or they might be going to Gallipoli to make a documentary about Gallipoli. And oh, as if anyone's going to be making a film about Gallipoli in the next couple of years. <laughs> so, I think um, we've got about 12 on the slate. You know, clearly all those projects would have been developed and nurtured and, you know, written and directed and produced by Australians. So it was deemed, you know, reasonable that the legislation kind of stretched to allow for some quake to be claimed when you're shooting offshore. Um, but there are, of, of course, um, as I said, it is limited. And what, what we're talking about, there's three limbs of a test here that need to be met. And the first one is, um, does the subject matter of your film reasonably require the use of the overseas location? And that might sound a little bit wordy. But what we're looking at here, say, for example, you're making in a film about um, an Australian composer who's working in a university in Germany and part of the film takes place in Germany, then clearly the subject matter of the film reasonably requires you to go to that location. Uh, or again, if you're making a documentary about, you know, going to interview, you know, people in Africa, then the subject matter of the film does require you to go there. Mm. And projects that find difficulty in sort of meeting this um, cause, Limb. Issue, limb, um, would be something like um, if something had a fantasy setting or was set in a parallel universe, for example, and you wanted to go to you know Nevada because you think Nevada looks like Mars, then actually that's not the subject matter of the film that is taking you to that location. So you actually would not be, you wouldn't meet the Gallipoli clause. And the other key projects are animations. Um, you know, you might go and choose to do some animation work in a studio in India or China or Korea and the subject matter of that film is not requiring you to go to those locations. So that's really important to remember. The other thing that um, projects often get in a bit of trouble with is about use of sound stages. Mm. That's highly unlikely that the subject matter of film is reasonably yep. requiring you to go to offshore sound stages because we've got a few here. Yep. They're pretty good too. Yeah, so that's the first thing. If you don't get past that point, then you know your project doesn't meet the Gallipoli Clause. And the second one is that it is only for the principal photography of the film. And Helen and I are going to talk about this in a bit more detail at the end of the session in terms of how this is represented at final certification. Um, but if you're going over there for your shoot, that's fine. Um, but if you go on a location recce for three weeks to Africa, then you can't claim any expenditure to do with that trip. Or if you've got some pre-production 
say three weeks pre in London, just before your six week shoot in London, then that three weeks, you can't claim anything to do with that first three weeks because it's not principal photography. And some people, I've had a few questions lately about people saying, oh, we're shooting in Australia, but I've sent my you know, location manager off to France to do a recce, but the shoot's taking place here, so isn't that principal photography? And it's not. It has to be, the principal photography has to be taking place in that offshore location. Um, and lastly, it's just to do with Australian residents. Um, so it's what we call remuneration for Australian residents for tax purposes. Um, and again, we'll talk about this in detail of what we're looking at at final. So, I mean, really, a really basic example is you've got an Australian DOP who's going overseas for a shoot. The subject matter requires you to go there and any, any um, remuneration associated with that person will be quaked. So, you know, her fee, her accommodation, her travel expenses will all be quaked. But the question here isn't actually about their nationality. We refer to Australians, but that means Australian residents for tax purposes. So literally, are they an Australian taxpayer? So Nick Cave, for example, <coughs> um, obviously he, that for composition, let's say that's irrelevant. Let's say you've got Nick Cave starring in your film. He lives in the, U in mm. the UK. He's not an Australian tax resident. So you're not going to get his salary to be quiet which can be an issue for actors because, let's face it, there are a lot of Australian actors that don't yeah. live here. It's tricky and, and it is explained in detail and at a glance and on the website version there's links to the Australian Tax Office. So mm. you can I think the important thing to remember about the Gallipoli <coughs> Clause though is because this is the way it's set up, it's intrinsically tied to subject matter and location shoots. Mm. It's about allowing you to use a location that is needed by your subject matter. It's not about anything else, so it's not about pre, it's not about post, it's not about making up the fact that you might want to shoot somewhere because it looks nice, does the subject matter of the film reasonably require that, the use of that location? But it's not an exact location necessarily. The way the explanatory memorandum to the legislation outlines it is it says that if you're making a film about Gallipoli, and it's weird that we call it Gallipoli Clause because Gallipoli was shot in South Australia, um, <laughs> that you might need to be to go to Gallipoli to shoot, but you may well not actually have access to Gallipoli. So you might be able to shoot somewhere else in Turkey, and that's fine, because that subject matter is reasonably required by the location. And it's probably also really important to note that this um, also applies if your film's an official co-production. Um, you know, that's a whole different ball game, and you're either eligible for a co-production or you're not. But if your project is an official co-production and you're applying for the offset, then the Gallipoli Clause still applies. So just because you're making a French Australian co-production, it doesn't mean you can go and do some animation in France and meet the Gallipoli Clause because mm -hmm. it's a co-production. Okay, key creatives. Here are all the important people. Matt Dina's sort of, I don't know, got a. Matt Dina and Ian Robertson. They got Ian, some names got up some here. Very uh, important executive producers. <laughs> Um, and again here what we're looking at, this has uh, relevance to SAC and QUAPE. Um, so it, it is important to fill this out correctly. And as you can see there are a number of non-Australian residents and nationals here. There's one executive producer from the UK, there's an American co-producer, um, there's even a, an American co-screenwriter um, and the director's Australian. And again, thinking about what I talked about at the beginning with the SAC test, you know, we're not going to look at this and say, oh, that's it, they're not going to meet the SAC test. But we'll take all of this into consideration when we're looking at um, those five matters. Mm. This column here is what's important for us here. Um, where it's quite, kind of like when we describe an Australian for the purposes of the SAC test, <coughs> we mean an Australian who is either a citizen or an Australian permanent resident. So that column actually refers to permanent residency and it only we, we care about it largely for SAC purposes when in this column it's something other than Australian. So in this case, uh, did we put one in? No, we didn't. So in this case, it may well be that Matt Hancock is a US national, but he is an Australian permanent mm. resident. And in which case, we'd consider them to be Australian. So assume that column refers to permanent residency, but of course it also has quite yeah. as well for the yep. Gallipoli Clause issues. Yep. Wow, there's a lot in this application form. And there's only six of us. There's only six of us. Um, okay, next page, which is again talking about the key creatives, but what we're talking about here is characters and cast. And again, we're looking at SAC and Quape. And really, um, again, people don't fill this out all the time. We, we don't care if, we, if you don't know who your actors are yet, but it's really good if you can give it, if you know you have to cast a UK actor in the lead or you know you have to cast an American in the lead, 
but you don't know who it is yet, let us know. So with the top box, what we're really looking at here is the nationalities of the characters. We're not thinking about actors yet. So actually all we're thinking about here is Sack. Um, and so there's four lead characters, Rebecca, Marty, Olivia and Boris. And Rebecca and Marty are English, so on screen those characters will be English. Mm. And um, just before we go on, here's a quick tip for anybody that's working with the, Ameri the Americans on an offset project. Neutral is not a nationality. <laughs> We've literally seen it. Neutral <laughs> means non-Australian. Because what the Yanks mean by American. it usually means American. Yeah. What we're talking about here is somebody who is, what we're asking is, are mm. they identifiably Australian? And if they're not, that may not be a problem, but we need to know. So yeah, fill out, you know, you fill out the top box and you go, okay, well there's two English, um, you know, lead characters in your film who are English. And then when we come down to your proposed cast, you can see there they are again. And Rebecca, you've managed to secure Sandy Watkins, who must just be an amazing Australian actress who's really good at doing English accents. So in terms of the SAC test, we're looking, you know, we look at Sandy and say, look, she's playing an English character, but for our purposes, for the SAC and Quape, she's an Australian national and an Australian resident. And then we come down to Marty, and you don't know who Marty is yet, but you want to get you know, someone really great from the UK playing that role. Um, so you can really see the, the complexities of what we're looking for. And, and again, if, you know, when you fill this second bit out properly, we'll look at your budget and we can clearly see, you know, the characters of Rebecca and Marty will probably be above the line. Um, you know, if they're working overseas, what portion of their fee will be quite, what portion of their fee will not be quite. Um, so if you don't fill this out properly, we will be asking you questions or if the budget's got things in it that are not in the application form, we're going to come back to you and ask some, ask some more questions. Yeah. So tying this back to the SAC test, this section goes to subject matter and this section goes to nationalities and residencies of the people involved. So everything we want to know, we want to know for a reason and we've got a question. Yeah, that's what I was just say. That was that it. Was that that's it. All I was just going to ask was, does the fact that the two lead characters are English play to the set? Absolutely. Part of the set, yep. Yep. What we don't have here, I don't think we've got the synopsis. This, we, we built a whole story about this film. We <laughs> yeah. had, like, it was great. But it's actually a story about an Australian who goes back to the UK to trace her to roots. To trace her family. So yeah. it, it's inherently Australian on screen. It's fascinating. David. <laughs> Hi there. Uh, and if anybody wants to option it. Um, in light that, I guess, nationality trumps residency in, in this section. Yeah, kind of. Going back to the, the Gallipoli clause, I was just a bit confused. So you, if you have an Australian actor playing an Australian character, your German mm -hmm. composer mm -hmm. or a composer who goes to Germany, yep. if they are, and let's be honest, most lead actors are perhaps not resident here. So if they're resident in the States, that doesn't get quite... No. So Even what though we they're talk an about, exactly. So we talk Australian. about we talk about it as being Australian for SAC purposes and Australian for Quake purposes. So for SAC purposes, that person is an Australian. For Quake purposes, the question is, are they paying tax in Australian in Australia and an Australian resident for taxation purposes? And their tax agent will be able to tell you that. So in your case, no, you wouldn't get Quake on this on their on their salary. And as Alex said, you know, there might be people. I have no idea what these people people's personal tax situations like. But if you think of someone like Anthony LaPaglia or Naomi Watts or, I don't know, those sorts of people. For, not that for, we're confirming or denying that any project that involves those people has or has not applied for anyway, whatever. But if we, if we see their, their name on the application form, they're an Australian national for the purposes of SAC. But if they're working outside Australia, then their fee will be non quake yeah. because they're not an Australian resident for tax purposes. That's not that something we have any um, discretion over either, David. It's legislative. One more question. Just continuing on this, what if that lead performer was an Australian uh, con a company contractor? Hang on. But the performer isn't a contractor. The performer is an actor. The performer is an actor, but their fee is paid via their company. Irrelevant. The so they're still non quape They'd be non quape The question is yep. always is that person an Australian resident for tax purposes providing services? And probably so if, if they have an Australian ABN, they still don't qualify? Are they an Australian... Is that entity an Australian tax-paying entity? And well, an ongoing Australian tax-paying entity? If they're an incorporated company up? in Australia and they have an Australian ABN, surely 
then they should be classified as an Australian resident. Um, I'll take that offline. It's really quite a complex question. Um, and it's also not one we've actually no. dealt with. I mean, if with. you look at um, the link, um, if you go to the At A Glance online, there's a link to the Australian Tax Office website, which talks about residency. And there's a whole sort of set of criteria that they look at. And one of the key things they look at is what is the person's intention. So just using good old Naomi Watts as an example, her intention is not to reside in Australia. Her intention is to reside, her domicile is, is outside Australia. And then there's a whole lot of other elements and then you, you kind of add all that up and say actually this person is not an Australian resident for tax purposes. But as Alex said, it is, it is quite complex. Yeah. Um, if there are any things and it, that... And it is an ATO yeah. ask um, us. definition. Ring up and ask, um, I think is the answer to that. And probably, maybe, um, just to go on from that, which we're probably not ready to do yet, but the reverse of that is that people often ask if you have an American or an English actor coming to Australia to work and um, you're paying their fee to their American agent, their fee is still quite... So if you cast Tom Cruise in your film and he comes out and works here for 13 weeks, then his, his fee for the time that he, he is here is quite... Always. Because he's providing his services in Australia. Yeah. But clearly you're not going to be paying it into his bank account, you're going to be paying his agent in America. And that's completely fine. Bill? I think the, uh, the thing about the residency is going to be a matter of fact. Um, either you are or you aren't. Yes. Yeah. But it's a personal thing between the person and the tax office. Yeah. And if it's a question, you're going to have to go to the person's account yeah. or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And they'll make a determination yeah. of whether it was last year they were or they were. Yeah. yeah, and that's uh, Bill's absolutely right. We're actually in contact with the tax office quite a bit, so we'd probably ring up and check. Alex is going to talk. Distribution. The next slide. No. No. Copyright. Whoops. Copyright. Don't get too excited. I know David's in the room and he can't wait for me to talk about distribution. Um, copyright, creative control, recoupment. You'd be staggered how often people get this wrong. This should be really easy. This stuff comes off your finance plan. Well, at least that one does, and. Um, that one does, that probably doesn't, it's in terms of the deal. But we get any number of applications that say production company 100% or list the directors of the company and list the <coughs> copyright, list 50% each. That's not what it is. The question is who will own copyright in the film? Now you may not know exactly what these percentages are, but to be honest, the difference between a project which is 68% Australian copyright held and 70% Australian copyright held is kind of meaningless. Our question is always, what is the extent to which Australians own the film? So that's what we want to know, and we want to know it based on the financial arrangements that underpin the project. Um, and not everybody has, doesn't have to be Australian owned always. There may well be cases where, and Ian and I will get to this a little bit later, where there isn't some non-Australian ownership, and that's fine, because the offset is supposed to open the Australian industry up to foreign investment. But this obviously should kind of reflect this, and really should really reflect this. And when we're talking about profit participation down here, what we're actually talking about, because it takes leaning to try and see it, it's just a list of who recoups in a profit position. This isn't about the sales agents, this is about the profit share. We don't really care about sales agents and distributors getting paid out, it's about the profit share. And I guess what we're really looking for here, if you say, um, you know, the entire profit share is going offshore, then mm. clearly that's something we're going to have regard to in our any other matters yeah. in, the, in the SAT test. It all comes back to the any yeah. other matters. Is it Australian or non-Australian, yeah. basically? Mike, sorry, Rochelle. <laughs> Wait, because the tape, they won't hear you on the tape. Uh, with the producer's profit share, do you also want to know if the producer has agreed to share some of its share with someone else or is it enough to put the producer there and whatever the producer's arrangements are it with probably, creatives? Probably best to let us know, just add something on the back that explains that, that. That will probably appear somewhere in your finance plan or in the deal, so we'll probably see it, at which point it's probably worth just letting us know. I mean, that's the question. As I said before, any complexity, tell us. So, I mean, you wouldn't normally always see a private arrangement the producer might have with a particular creative in a finance plan. No, good point. In which case, yes, tell us. Please. Up front. Lucy? That's right. Mike, all right. We could, should have mic'd you up to start with. No, this page always confounds me. Um, in what circumstances would the beneficial interest in copyright be different from the ownership of copyright? Yeah, good point. It shouldn't be. 
that, that's why I've, it's always confused me because I can see that you can have different ownership of copyright than you do have share that's of what profit, you're referring but beneficial to. ownership of copyright. Yeah, what we're after is the copyright ownership as per the finance plan. It's, it's awkwardly worded and it's mm. awkwardly worded, would you believe, because of the producer offset rules 2007 which are drafted in that way. What we're after is the copyright ownership of the film as per the finance plan. Okay. Um, we're running out of time a little bit so we're going to finish off with distribution. Here we um, go. So a provisional certification, what we're looking for, the legislation tells us that your film must be available to an Australian audience. And if you're making a non-feature film, which will attract the 20% offset, this is a very easy test to satisfy. I mean, generally, you know, programs do uh, are broadcast on television in Australia, but you could make a film and it could go straight to DVD, and you could sell these DVDs on your website, or it could be, you know, content, you know, available for downloading. So that that 20%. You can have it ad supported for, on YouTube, and that yeah. would meet our test. So that test is very easy. To meet, no, so we, we don't look at that with a lot of rigour at provisional certification, it has to be said. But what we do look at with rigour at provisional certification is the 40% rebate because your film must be a feature film made for theatrical distribution in Australia. And, um, and that's a much higher bar yeah. um, to be that we set at provisional certification. So it's kind of like an extra test that we add on to feature films when we issue a provisional certificate to a feature. If you if we don't consider that your film, we refer to it as ticking off distribution or demonstrated bona fide intent, and I'll get back get to what that <coughs> means in a second, but if you don't satisfy that, you'll still get a provisional certificate as a feature film, but it just means that we'll have to look at the distribution arrangements at a later date, whether that be through a reassessment process or in the final application. So the big question everybody always asks is, what do we need to do? That's what you need to do. You need to have a demonstrated bona fide intent that demonstrates that you are after making, you are going to make a feature film. Now, obviously, every producer is going to say, I'm making a feature film because I want a 40% offset. So would anybody that's making a telly movie and actually wants to get a 40% offset, even though they should only be entitled to a 20% offset. The question that's going to come up is why feature film means cinematic. Feature film means cinema and theatres, because that's kind of what the legislation tells us it does. So oh, it's not us. We're not saying that. DVD features or telly movies aren't feature films. That's what the legislation tells us. So our question is, does your film have the ability to get on screens? And that means cinema screens. Now, in a provisional stage, all there really is is a screenplay and maybe some actors' names and some key creatives and hopefully a distribution deal. Because effectively what we do when we ask this question is we outsource that decision to somebody independent from the production that is in a position to commit money to the film on the grounds that it is a cinematic feature film. Thankfully there's a whole cohort of people whose job it is to make those decisions and they're called distributors. So what we're going to be asking you to provide is at least a letter of offer, offer, not a letter of intent, letter of offer or higher, draft deal memo, even if you've got it, full distribution deal with a recognised theatrical distributor for Australia New Zealand. And that person should hopefully put some money on the table committing funds that the film is cinematic, whether that be through a distribution guarantee or a P&A. And your question's going to be, who is a recognised distributor? Obviously there are about 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 of them who are clearly theatrical recognised distributors because we all know they are. And I'm not going to list them because that's not my job. But clearly there are a bunch of people who are obviously theatrical distributors. You know who's not a theatrical distributor? Parent Company Distributions Pty Ltd <laughs> that was incorporated last week. Self-distribution is really hard. Not many people can do it successfully. There are a couple of examples recently that have worked. But to be perfectly frank, you're going to have to give us an awful lot of information for us to be satisfied of that. The other question that we get is people who are new to the distribu distribution game who haven't been doing it a long time. Our question is always going to be about track record. So if you're coming to us with a distributor who is brand new or very recent or isn't very well known or is specialises in you know, releasing Chinese films for the Chinese market in Australia and wants to get into distributing Australian films, add a whole lot of information about that distributor because we'll be coming back to you and saying what are their last 10 films they've released and what was the box office and how broad was their releases. That's the sort of information we're going to want to know and we will definitely ask you for it so provide it with the application form. Rochelle, we're going to have a bunch of questions. 
Starting there. I just want to ask about forewalling and um, whether you know a, a producer's plan to sort of do an event-based forewalled release in you know a cinema or a few cinemas here and there would 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 um, satisfy the test. It's a really tough question because there's four walling and there's four walling. I mean, if you're touring a film around and you're taking it to a couple of hundred screens with the cast and doing Q&As, then that's great. If you're going to Wagga and doing one screen, that's not. So usually at provisional stage, that sort of plan's not going to get anywhere because it's clearly contrived. It's contrived purely to get the offset. What you're making is a film you're going to release on, um, on iTunes and hopefully you'll make a fortune and you're only getting it on cinema screens purely to tick this box. What we're asking is, it, is it realistic? Is it actually a feature film? So the, there's not really a yes, no answer to your question. It really depends on the circumstances underpinning it. But in most cases at provisional, it's not going to be enough. But if you can come to us at a final stage and you can show us that it's had, you know, over the course of a month, it's had 150 screen, screenings, then maybe, I don't know. It kind of depends. But the key question is always, is it commercial? So if you're forewalling and letting your mates come and see it, no. 